Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy. We want to thank all of our supporters, as well as those who have shown their support by shopping at the Academy store. We appreciate you. And a special thanks to scholar James Owens for suggesting this topic. Understand that when we introduce a technology in a lesson, we are not saying that it is the only way to get something done, or even the best way. The best method to use in the real world is the one that works for the least expense. Here our goal is to introduce and discuss space technology. A staged rocket works fine without aerospikes. Single stage to orbit rockets, especially those that will operate on different worlds, like Mars, Titan, and Callisto, will absolutely benefit from aerospikes. So will any engine operating in a vacuum. The problem aerospike engines are addressing is that any fixed nozzle will have optimal performance at only one pressure. Everywhere else, the nozzle will be underexpanded at lower pressure or overexpanded at higher pressure. On the moon, a vacuum nozzle is fine, but if you land on Titan and fire one of these, where the surface pressure is 1.5 times Earth's atmosphere at sea level, the instabilities could destroy your ship. Now Starship has three vacuum raptors and three sea level raptors. In most environments, this combination will be great. You can use the vacuum raptors as the second stage fires to go into orbit or on the moon and Mars, while using sea level raptors for control and on Titan. But what if even sea level raptors are too big for Titan? Is there a way to augment a large nozzle so that it is efficient at all pressures? Rocket scientists have worked extremely hard to improve rocket function. Just a few percent difference can dramatically improve a rocket's capabilities. One solution that was developed is based on the afterburner effect. Afterburners were developed for jet engines. A jet engine can operate only in an atmosphere. The jet aircraft does not carry its own oxidizer, like a rocket does. Both systems carry their fuel. But a jet pulls its oxygen from the air. As an interesting aside, jet aircraft on Titan will carry oxygen tanks only and pull the fuel from the air. The atmosphere of Titan is mostly methane and will burn perfectly well if you just add some oxygen. Back to Earth. Here is a jet engine and here is the compressor to pull in air and compress it before it goes into the combustion chamber. These engines use rotating blades and stationary blades up here. Here is the combustion chamber and here is the fuel burner where fuel is injected into the compressed air and ignited. The hot gas produced forces its way past these blades, causing some of them to spin while others are still stationary. Fluid dynamics is its own science, but I think of it this way. The compressor uses rotating blades and stationary blades. The rotating blades at the front of a jet engine, here, are spinning and imparting kinetic energy to the air, pressing it forward and compressing it but the gas will start rotating with the blades. That would reduce the effectiveness of compression. The stationary blades stop that rotation, so the air can be compressed more by the next set of rotating blades. We are turning kinetic energy into high pressure. This part where the fuel is introduced is called the fuel burner. In this way, the hot expanding gas is imparting kinetic energy to the rotating blades. These rotating blades are connected to a shaft. The shaft transfers the kinetic energy absorbed back here to provide power to the compressor at the front of the engine, up here. That's how a jet engine works. There are stationary blades back here also to prevent gas rotation from reducing engine efficiency. We are turning gas expansion and pressure into kinetic energy. The momentum of the gas moving through the engine and out the back creates the thrust that pushes our jet forward. As a jet airplane is flying through the air and has reached the limit of its thrust ability, you can add extra fuel back here, behind the usual fuel burner. This fuel ignites on contact with the hot gas and adds extra thrust. This is called an afterburner, as the fuel is added after the burner. Afterburners dramatically improve the power produced by a jet engine at the expense of reduced efficiency. We could use a similar system in a large rocket engine nozzle to prevent overexpansion at low altitudes. 
And here's how that works. Here is an example of a rocket engine. This is a sea level optimized engine. It works great at takeoff, but as we go higher, it starts to suffer from under expansion and starts to lose efficiency, wasting fuel and reducing our payload to orbit capability. This is a vacuum optimized engine of the same type. Everything is pretty much the same, except the size of the nozzle. Now we will be efficient at high altitude, low pressure, but when we fire this at sea level, if the pressure mismatch is too high, the outside air will work its way into the engine, causing exhaust flow separation back in the nozzle. This causes turbulence and can destroy your engine. Elon Musk recently talked about why SpaceX can test the vacuum Raptor engine at sea level without worrying about instabilities. He said the pressure under which the Raptor operates, about 230 bar in normal operation with a maximum of 330 bar, is so high that there is no danger of critical overexpansion. This tells us that the Vacuum Raptor nozzle is not squeezing every bit of efficiency it can out of the engine. SpaceX has decided that the mass penalty of a larger nozzle is not offset by the increase in efficiency the larger nozzle would provide. I have seen people comment that Elon said the Raptor is perfect. That is not what he said. He said the efficiency of the combustion process is very close to the theoretical maximum. This is due to the extremely high pressure in the combustion chamber. That does not mean there are no improvements possible when converting that combustion efficiency into thrust efficiency. We sometimes get angry feedback when we suggest something SpaceX is doing might be improved. I expect some from the title of this lesson. We must be careful in our admiration for what Elon Musk and SpaceX has accomplished that we don't fall into the trap of assuming that their way is the only way, or that there might not be a better way to do something. We must always be open to the possibility of error. I can assure you that Elon follows this philosophy. He first thought that carbon fiber would be the best choice of material for Starship. He was wrong. Here is a massive metal spindle that he paid for. But when he saw that his rocket mass increased, the complexity and mass of carbon construction and the expense offset the benefits. He also noticed that the relative structural mass of steel components dropped with increasing mass of the Starship itself. And with common steel's much higher resistance to heat, there was a place, as rockets got bigger, that steel was a better choice over carbon fiber. He also noticed the cost savings you can build a lot more starships for the same amount of money. He did not, as a lot of companies do, stay wedded to his first choice, not wanting to admit he might have been wrong. This tendency is called the sunk cost fallacy and is commonly recognized in gamblers. I've invested too much to walk away now. We are all prone to this way of thinking. Recognizing when we are off course lets us make changes that keep us from wasting even more resources. Elon threw this giant expensive piece of equipment away and started welding cookware steel into a starship. Never be afraid to change course if you see a better way to reach your destination. But rocket scientists have thought of a solution besides aerospike engines. What if we put small afterburners here in a ring around the nozzle? Then at low altitudes, we inject extra fuel and oxygen. This will ignite, and the pressure from this exhaust plume will create a virtual nozzle. We will use our flight computer to adjust the ejection mass propellant flow so as to stay optimized at every altitude. When we are in vacuum, we can turn this off and just use the main nozzle. These can work very well, and it is even possible to use hydrogen with less efficient fuels, like RP-1, to improve performance even more. Let's take a look at one of these engines. Here we see a thrust augmented nozzle. Here are the injectors. What could we do with an engine like this? Let's go back to our Delta Clipper and make an Ultra Clipper. Let's increase the size of the original DCX by five times. We go from 12 meters tall to 60 meters and four meters wide to 20.5 meters. This makes it bigger than the Starship second stage. Remember that as a ship gets bigger, the structural mass to propellant mass ratio drops. This massive hydrogen tank 
worked fine for the space shuttle. If we use bigger engines like the RS-68, producing almost 3,000 kilonewtons, we would need at least 12 of them, as efficient as the RL-10A vacuum engines, with an efficiency of 465.5 seconds in vacuum, and about 400 seconds at sea level, to have a thrust-to-weight ratio of 1.25. Now as length and width go up by a factor of 5, surface area goes up by 5 squared, or 25, and volume goes up by 5 cubed or 125. This ship is an elongated pyramid, and we find the volume of a pyramid using this equation. This ship will have a volume of about 8,405 cubic meters. The oxidizer propellant mass of hydrolock systems with optimum oxidizer to fuel ratio of about 4 would be 330 kilograms per cubic meter. If we assume 500 cubic meters for our payload bay and crew area, and 405 cubic meters for engine bay and structural systems, we are left with 7,500 cubic meters of propellant volume. This would give us a mass of 2,475,000 kilograms of propellant. The Starship uses steel and has a dry mass that is 10% of the propellant mass. Larger ships do better on dry mass ratio, but let's use that same number and assume that our dry mass will be 247,500 kilograms, a little more than twice that of Starship. But we have twice the propellant mass. That gives us a total initial mass of 2,722,500 kilograms. We have not added payload, but we'll get to that. If we launch this thing, where will we get? Without a payload, this rocket has a delta V of 10,582 meters per second, assuming an average specific impulse of 450 seconds. We will use 9,400 of that to get to low Earth orbit with an orbital velocity of about 7,800 meters per second losing the rest to aerodynamic and gravity drag. We should be able to get 100 tons to lower Earth orbit. We release the payload, then burn a little delta V to get us back in the atmosphere, where air friction will help us slow down, so we can come back and land. Coming down base first, we'll enter at a six degree angle and fire the engines briefly to create a plasma shield. We will then belly flop like Starship. The side of the ship has an area of 615 square meters while the base is only a little more than 420 square meters. We'll come down a little bit like this to present the broadest surface area to the airflow. Then flip and land, using what's left of our propellant at the last minute, just like the Starship. How effective is this system? If we could make everything work just the way we planned, we would have a reusable single stage to orbit spaceship, capable of getting 100 tons to lower Earth orbit. Is this better than Starship? Not even close. Starship will get 150 tons to low Earth orbit. Single stage to orbit ships with anything less than about 900 seconds of specific impulse are not a good option on Earth. Two stage rockets will win every time. But on almost every other world we will be visiting, they will work just fine. Let's do a little math. We will ignore atmospheric drag, including in freefall. The delta V needed to get into a low Mars orbit is about 4,100 meters per second. We could take our empty Ultra Clipper, 247,500 kilograms, add 2,475,000 kilograms of propellant, and 200,000 kilograms for payload. That gives us an initial mass of 2,922,500 kilograms. When we launch from Mars' surface, we reach a low Mars orbit having burned 1,768,200 kilograms of propellant. Our new mass is 1,154,300 kilograms. We can dock with a ship from Earth, offload our 200 tons of cargo, and load 200 tons of goods from Earth. These are always metric tons, by the way. Our mass is still 1,154,300 kilograms, since we just replaced the mass that we unloaded onto the other ship we will burn propellant landing back on Mars, ending up with our empty mass of 247.5 tons and 200 tons of cargo, with a little more than 8 tons of propellant left over. The methane-fueled Starship, in contrast, can only do the same from Mars with about 28,000 kilograms payload. That is because Starship uses a booster on Earth and comes back with no cargo. On Mars, there is no booster and bringing things down from orbit will be important. Starship has a much lower specific impulse, 22.5% less, 
than a Hydrolox rocket. Starship can bring back more if it launches with no payload, and it will also be able to reduce the landing delta V requirement by using terminal velocity. But so can the Ultra Clipper. SpaceX is using methane for a lot of different reasons. It can be easily produced on Mars and is a lot easier to store. And there is less boil off. It is denser and reduces ship volume. This is very important in thicker atmospheres. But once we have a colony on Mars with its thin atmosphere, with steel production and water to hydrogen processing, a hydrogen powered Ultra Clipper may be a better option. Starship can bring passengers and cargo from Earth, and the Ultra Clipper can meet it in orbit, bringing up 200 tons of methane to help the Starship get back home. Something to think about. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and stay safe at Astra Proterra.